Emily, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. Thank you so much for taking part in this interview today. I'm very happy to have you here. And you are a multi-potentialite. Can you tell us what that means? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. This is this is really fun. Um, yeah, so a multi-potentialite is someone with many interests and creative pursuits. It's um, it's someone who you know has trouble being put into one category, um, like someone who wants to do many things and be many things and explore many things. Okay, so when people ask you, what do you do? How do you answer? Mm, uh, it kind of depends who's asking. Mm-hmm. Um, and it depends who's asking and why. Mm-hmm. So um, if someone's just being polite, or if it's like, you know, um, I'm like crossing the border and the person there's like, what do you, you know, asking what would I do? I'll usually say I'm a writer because that's just like simple, neat. But if it's someone who's genuinely interested in getting to know me and we're having a whole conversation, then I will say I run an online community and they'll be like, oh, what's that about? And then I'll talk about putty like and the different work I do. And I might mention my book. And yeah, usually, you know, I don't have like a great um, 15 second elevator pitch. I, I just prefer to have a conversation if possible. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the most feared questions of multi-potentialites yeah. in your book. <laughs> Because yeah. then would be, I think people ask me that as well. Because I'm as a multi potential. Like, when I say mm-hmm. I'm a writer, then the next question is, what do you write about? You know, and then it right. kind of goes on. <laughs> yeah. Well, Pretty people funny. ask me what I write about, and then I say, oh, I write about people who have many passions, and then they're like, oh, okay. tell me, you know. So that also kind of leads into the, the the topic. But of course, there's like other things that I do also, and mm-hmm. sometimes I bring those things up, and sometimes I don't. It kind of just depends. Yeah. Speaking of your online community, it's called the Pottyverse. Is that correct? It is. Um, yeah. Can you tell us all about that and and how it works? Sure. Um, okay. So there's two websites. There's Putty Like and the Pottyverse. Mm-hmm. On Putty Like, you can get lots of free articles about what it means to be a multi potentialite, how to thrive in the world as a multipod, um, and then if you want more support, you can join the Puttyverse. And the Puttyverse is a private community. We've got a very active forum. We've got events every week. There's like sometimes there's like 20 events on our calendar because we encourage our members to create their own events. And it's a community of multi potentialites, people with all kinds of interests and um, but yeah, basically we support each other. Um, we do workshops, we do co-working, which we call, we call those focus parties where we're all kind of working on different projects and we set timers and um, we have accountability matchmaking where you can get paired up with another multi-potentialite and you can be your accountability buddies and check in about your projects. And it's just kind of like, it's a community for support to help people who want to embrace their many passions and build a life around you know, doing multiple things. I saw that it's quite, um, well, it's not so easy to be, become a member of this, uh, the Potty Bears. I saw that you can't just pay <laughs> and, and become a member. It's a bit more complicated. Can you tell us what the process is and, and why you created it this way? Well, so we open the doors once a month to uh-huh. new members. So, I mean, it is some, like you do just go and pay and become a member, but it, you have to do it during the two day window. Um, and you can get on the email wait list um, if you go to the puttyverse.com and then we'll send you an email a week before the doors open and then when the doors open. Um, and we do it this way. <laughs> yeah, we do it this way just um, mostly to kind of make the space feel safer for our existing members so that we don't have like new people popping in all the time. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to just like rally around the new cohort coming in and welcome everyone at the same time. And a bunch of people are posting their introductions in the forum at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, both for the people joining just so that they can get the support from our team and from the community and for our existing members um, it, it works well to have just this like concentrated period of time every month where new people join. And do you kind of make sure that they are multi-potentialites or is it just naturally attract multi-potentialites? <laughs> we don't, no, we don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, we, you know, anyone can join the community as long as they abide by our community guidelines. We've got guidelines that we wrote and got feedback from the community. And so as long as people are being kind and respectful and 
inclusive. Um, they, I don't really care if they're a multi-potentialite or not. I mean, if they're there and they're getting something out of it and they're interacting, if they don't identify as a multipod, yeah, I, I don't care, <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, and obviously they're getting something out of it. So um, no, we don't, we don't like quiz people first or like okay. make them apply or anything. There's a lot of pressure on people to kind of find their purpose and find fit in a box, you know, with work. And I had the same issues myself with my own journey. And um, when other people find what they're doing, you know, mid twenties or just after university, and it can be very, you know, you don't know what to do after having so much guidance from university. And I guess being a multi-potential, like having so many different interests, well, it was like this for me, it was very daunting and kind of a bit, I felt, I didn't really find my place in the world. And I guess, was it like that for you? And when the moment, what was the moment like when you discovered you were a multi-potentialite and it could be your biggest asset? Was What was that mm -hmm. moment like? Yeah, um, it was It was definitely a lot like that for me too. I think I felt a lot of anxiety um, all growing up in my teens and in my early 20s where I would think I found my thing and I would, I would get really good at it actually and I'd start pursuing it professionally and then I would sort of be like oh, okay I kind of like I kind of got what I came for like I this is, this is getting a little bit boring and I want to explore something new but every time I did that I would feel this like tremendous guilt and shame and I'd just be like what's wrong with me like why can't I just pick something and stick with it forever like <laughs> you know um and I think it was so I was in law school. I finished law school, but I didn't want to become a lawyer. I was, I reached that end point again for myself where I was like, ah, I don't think that's right for me. Um, and I was exploring the idea of starting something of my own. Um, and I took uh, an online class on like building, building a business, coming up with a business idea. And I got stuck in the second module, which was all about choosing a niche. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, I was making all these lists, I was journaling. Um, and I was like, I can't choose a niche because there's like all these different things I'm interested in. And then I realized like, maybe that's the problem that I could try and solve. Like, you know, maybe there are other people out there who are doing many things and are, have like found a way to make it work professionally um, and are happy and don't feel this tremendous sense of guilt and anxiety and are just like embracing it and living that life. Um, so I started blogging about that topic and writing about my experiences and talking to other people about their experiences. Um, and I conducted a whole bunch of interviews for my book um, and tried to, yeah, just kind of shared what I was learning. And that's how Putty Like started. Um, and I think it was through that process um, that I came to accept my own multipotentiality, just through seeing other people who were like, happy and successful and also just making the choice to like stop feeling bad about it and start embracing it and and then I could see like the gifts that it it brings you know I mean I could use my my web design skills on for this project um I could use some of the writing skills that and like writing good arguments that I learned in law school um in articles on my website and like there I was just like using all these skills that I learned in different places um to build this this community this business um and I was like okay you know maybe this is a thing that that multi-potentialites do we like draw from different backgrounds different areas and we use those skills in you know unconventional ways but that's like a huge asset um so yeah that that's kind of my process that's amazing. It's amazing going from the a negative to being a big asset. You know, it's such an incredible realization, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And I think that's like a lot of people experience that when they come to Putty Like or when they see my TED talk, um, just this feeling of relief. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I hope to be able to provide more than that, like support and resources and all this stuff. But if all they get is just a feeling of relief and like, some self-acceptance then that's that's wonderful so in your book how to be everything I love it it's one of my friends who's actually a member of your website recommended this to me and I bought it straight away because I completely identified with the concept and also you you mentioned four types of multi-potential I hear would you like to tell us what they are 
Sure. Um, and I will say there are four work models and, uh -huh. I, you know, people, they're not types of multi-potentialites just because I don't want people to be like, which type am I? And like, okay. feel like they need to put themselves <laughs> into a box. You can move between these work models, you can blend them, but they are like a starting place. Um, and I wanted to provide that. So when I was interviewing people for the book, my main question was like, how do you structure your career to get the variety and the money and the meaning that you need in your life. Um, and I found that, you know, people did it in all kinds of different ways. I met multi-potentialites who were entrepreneurs and artists and uh, multi-potentialites who were doctors and had more conventional careers. And I was like, okay, how do I make sense of this? And what I was able to do is kind of fit everyone more or less into one of these four work models. So, um, I'll go through the four models. Um, so we've got the group hug approach. And this is where you, it's like all of your interests coming together in a big group hug. It's very <laughs> cozy. Nice name. That, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is where you find one job or um, a business that you own, perhaps, where you get to wear many different hats and do many different things. Um, I interviewed a woman named Margot who works at a company where they like let her move between departments. And, um, you know, she, she's been there for like 20 years or something. And the reason it stayed interesting is that she's got, she, she got, to, you know, she's done a lot of different things, um, some web design, some video editing, uh, a whole bunch of things. Um, so that's the first model is to kind of like do multiple things in one entity, whether that's a job, for your own business, something like that. Um, the second work model is what I call the slash approach. And this is where you have multiple part-time um, jobs and or businesses. Um, so this is someone who's like the, and this is the person I interviewed, who is um, a freelance marketer slash uh, she works at a nonprofit for a few days a week slash she's an aerial silks artist. You know, this is like the person who's a programmer slash yoga instructor slash accountant. You know, this is, uh -huh. yeah. So like people who have, who use this model, like each of their slashes, each of their revenue streams um, for different reasons. They use a different part of their brain. They, you know, bring out a different side of their personality. Um, but they tell me, they've told me that they wouldn't want to do any one of them full time. So the part time nature is very intentional um, and they get that variety by kind of um, cycling through these different work projects over the course of their week. Um, and then the third, the third commonly used work model is the Einstein approach. And I called it this because Albert Einstein worked at the patent office. So he had this like government job. It was very stable, full time. Um, but it was notoriously slow paced. So it allowed him to develop his theories on the side um, after work. And so this, you know, some people will do this. Some people will have a stable nine to five that kind of like provides the resources that they need, but leaves them with enough free time and money to pursue their passions on the side. So one of the people I interviewed for this section was a guy named Charlie Harper, who is an IT director. Uh, but then when he leaves the office, he goes to a cappella group and he performs in musical theater. And he he's also a carpenter. And when we spoke, he had just built a boat. Um, so, you know, the benefit of this approach, well, one of the benefits is that you don't need to monetize every single passion, every single thing that you become interested in. You can just kind of explore freely and know that you're your full-time job is supporting those different passions. Um, of course, it, it, that work needs to provide you with the resources you need and um, not let you, you can't, it can't take up like all of your time. It needs to leave you with enough free time to um, explore those things. And that's where the term good enough job comes in, which I think is a Barbara share term that I use in that section of my book. Um, and then we've got the, the Phoenix approach. And this is someone who dives into one field for a number of years and builds a career in that area. And then at a certain point, they transition and they start something new in a totally different space. Um, and people who use this model 
Um, we'll, we'll often like explore the next thing a little bit on the side, just while they're still doing the first thing to make that transition a bit smoother. Um, but yeah, I've seen this when I've interviewed multi-potential. Like someone will be, you know, one thing for 10 years and then they'll switch and they'll start a whole new career in a different area. Um, and that's another way to make it work. So, so would you say and, that you were a phoenix then in the past? Uh, um, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Right now, I'm definitely a group hug. Okay, because I think you talked like about, it, about the different, there's like a diagram of those different paths that you were on. <laughs> and now, yeah, yeah. Interest. I mean, I do tend to, mm -hmm. I'm more of a, a sequential multi-potentialite. I think I tend to dive into fewer things for a longer period, as opposed to being a simultaneous multipod where I've got like 20 things that I'm equally interested in all the time. Um, so I think that does lend itself more to the Phoenix thing. I'd say I'm like a mix between Phoenix and group hug. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe your journey is a bit similar to mine because I became a group hug like when I started. My blog is AM um, 13 years today is like my blog oh, anniversary. Wow. But as soon as I made that decision, um, everything kind of came together because I was, you know, a writer and a, a podcaster and, you know, um, what else am I doing? YouTuber. And I'm also writing for different um, media outlets in England and in Spain. So I've had all these different things that have come together because it's, it's all about the same similar topics like lifestyle, sexual wellness. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like um, this was really I don't know. I feel like more my identity. I don't know how I, how I would describe it. It just feels like the right path. Whereas before, it was absolute confusion because I was an, a reluctant phoenix. You know, just mm. losing jobs after a while or contracts were over. It's like, what do I look do now? You know, mm -hmm. and wanting to live in a place like Barcelona, you can't just go for anything. It's not maybe as good as some other job markets other way, in other places in the world. So it was really difficult sometimes to. So I think we always all define ourselves, although many people buy our jobs. And when you find that your job is not valuing you, it's very, it really hurts your ego, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one benefit of the group hug approach is it does feel like you're getting to express the, the breadth of who you are in what you do. And there's something very satisfying about that. I, I feel that too. I feel kind of like my online community is, like like putty like is kind of like a digital reflection of me which mm -hmm. feels really nice feels very authentic and that's, yeah it's a good feeling i really liked how you addressed some of the um challenges of multi-potentialites because one of the challenges i have um i'm sure you probably have as well is, is the the overwhelm of wanting to do so many things actually i think mm -hmm. that more potential should be ceos of like huge organizations because you <laughs> kind of know how a lot of little things work and it'd be nice just to kind of be the decision maker and not have to do the grind you know what do you think yeah I think a lot of CEOs probably maybe most of them are multi-potentialites like I think you kind of need to be one to to run a business um yeah so what do I think about overwhelm, overwhelm yeah that's, that's quite common I think with any any um I mean, I, I admire people who are slash a lot because it takes a lot of dedication after you've done your job that's not not your passion to then follow your passion I remember I had a few days when I was because um, I'm a qualified English teacher as well and I've always had that qualification in my pocket whenever I've needed it or someone's asked me mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted some quick money and then I just felt exhausted because it's just and it's about energy as well I just feel like you know just time for money and something I'm not interested yeah. in and then to try and find the energy to do something I am interested in that's maybe it's a bit slow to get off the ground at first it just takes an extra effort you know so I really admire people who who are that maybe the Einstein approach and the mm. slash as well you're dividing your energy into different things yeah I I think you know especially with the slash approach having things that are very different from one another can help I think it's actually mm. it can feel re refreshing to go and do something totally different mm. um but if you're doing a lot of the same kind of work that can get pretty exhausting mm. um from what I've heard um and that's been my experience too. Um, yeah, I mean, with the overwhelm, there's like a there's a few things you can do. I mean, like focusing on small small steps, um, especially if if you're working on something like a big exciting project. Sometimes that can feel really overwhelming because you've got the resistance, you've got the like 
ah, what if this doesn't work? Or like, you know, all those like emotional things, fear of failure, fear of success, all of that. Um, so breaking it down into small steps can really help getting some support from whether it's a community or a group or just a friend who is, you know, you're checking in on each other. I, I have a little mastermind group, a few friends that I've been working with for like almost a decade now and we check in and we set goals. And so that kind of support can really help. Um, and then when you're planning your day, um, don't, like I, I like to have a very short to-do list. And then if I get extra things done, then that's awesome. I can like celebrate that, but it can be really disheartening to have like a long, long, long list. And then you just like get a few things done. I prefer to set my, set my expectations for myself low. And then like, if I get extra things done, cool. That's great. <laughs> that's a bonus. So what about outsourcing? That's a great way to uh, resolve some of the issues with mm -hmm. multi-potentialites. Yeah. Outsourcing's great. Of course you need to make sure you find the right people and that might require training people and, um, but yeah, that can be, that can be awesome. I mean, I've got a great team, um, but it's taking time to find the right people and it's mm -hmm. an evolving yes, process. Helpful. Yeah, definitely. So how do you think the pandemic um, and all the, mm. how they, how, how has that affected multi-potentialites? And do you think everyone has had to become one because as a mm. consequence? I don't know about everyone. I think probably, you know, I, I've heard that a lot of people when the pandemic started we're like okay what do I really want right now like this is kind of a, a reset in some ways um and so more people have been embracing their multi-potentiality certainly more people have been joining our community um and I've seen that in a major way um I don't know if everyone has had to become a multipod but if they want to be one I think that this is a, a you know kind of out of necessity like people are looking at their different skills and say what can I do how can I make this work and everyone's working online now so that's a lot more accepted and there's more opportunities there for creativity for you know distributing your own content if you want to do that um, there's a great research paper that came out about how the pandemic um, has created more of a need for, I, they don't call us multi-potentialites, but like creative polymaths, or I forget what they call us exactly, but um, it's like a straight up academic paper. And I thought it was really cool that that, that came out. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people have had to adapt um, to things that I was living before the pandemic, such as yeah. you know, that self-discipline and working from home and uh, spending a lot of time alone, like a lot of freelancers mm -hmm. do or something. Yeah. That must have been a big, a big um, shock to the system for people who are, are not used to that. Yeah, I mean, shock to the system for everyone, but yeah. 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 So um, tell us more about the writing process of your book uh, as a multi-potentialite, how was it? How was the process? It was good. Um, my editor, not all editors will do this, I've learned, but my editor was cool with me sending her a chapter at a time and okay. that really helped. So I just like, I had, deadlines I just focused on one chapter at a time uh -huh. uh, and that made it feel a lot more manageable than trying to write the whole thing and deliver the whole thing um but yeah it it's been a while now but I it was it was a pretty positive experience mm -hmm. and I don't I, I don't know I don't think that that is always the case when people write <laughs> write a book but I think the key was really breaking it up into small chunks so is that your answer to a lot of things then with multi-potentialism is just kind of breaking it down into small chunks in general with work? And... At least that is what's worked for me. And I see that work with other people. I think that, you know, when it comes to like productivity techniques, there's so many tools and tricks and everyone's so different. So you need to kind of like pick and choose what works for you. Um, but yeah, I'm a fan of breaking things down. And I, you know, I, I use a timer a lot. I'll set a, if I'm having trouble getting started on something, I'll set a five minute timer and I'll say like, just go nuts for five minutes, just work on it for five minutes. And if you want to stop at the end of the five minutes, you can, but usually that's like enough to like break the ice and then I'm in the flow and I'm like, okay, I can keep going. Um, so yeah, I guess I do tend to break things down into small chunks. One way. thing I liked about in your book as well is how um, you have like, this line about people who value stability with, was it flexibility? I can't remember what the two things mm. were. Um, stability and I can't remember where it was. 
but I really I identified with that because um, I can't remember where it is now. Um, so I do, I do think people who you know who want stability, they're looking at um, you know, or it is sim no, it's not simultaneous sequential. It's something else about people who value you know the flexibility of having your own time and yes. the stability of having you know a paid job. <laughs> you know or the uncertainty yeah. it's, it's very it's very easy it's, that's kind of like one of those challenges and I think that each model can attract different types of people and I see, see that in Barcelona there's a big um expat community of digital nomads mm -hmm. and then you get some people who have you know expat jobs some of the people who are life coaches at 28 <laughs> it's a whole right. a whole range of people but I think for me I definitely value that flexibility of time because I think that's a huge yeah. asset of um that we have and other people want to have that that salary every month or that contract yeah yeah and it, it can change over the course of our lives depending on what's going on and family and circumstances and um we can value different like stability or flexibility or both um and it's just a matter of finding that balance but yeah i think that the einstein approach in particular really appeals to people who value stability and just want to know that their income is coming in every month it's there they can just do their job um, and they're you know happy and comfortable viewing that work as the thing that funds their passion projects and all the other things that they're that they're excited about um, and of course like it's important that that work be enjoyable like I don't yeah you know people who are happy with with this model that that those are the people that I was interviewing that I really wanted to hear from not people that like hated their job um, and wish they could get out so yeah the you know even if it's not like everything you it's not the dream job it's still something enjoyable maybe it's something where you get to learn at work a little bit and um yeah I don't know sometimes people get to bring in their different skills but yeah that that Einstein approach definitely provides a bit more stability so your TED talk has been very successful and why some of us don't have one true calling. So how was that process of uh, making a TED talk? Oh, that was cool. That was a really exciting um, process and project. Um, I, I wanted to get into public speaking because it was something that made me very anxious, like many for many of us. Um, but I saw, I felt like the message is, is more important than like, you know my anxiety and also I just wanted to do it for myself just to like show myself I could do it um so I did a bunch of research um to find you know what TEDx events were happening nearby um and there was one happening a few hours away in Bend Oregon I was I was living in Portland at the time and um yeah I applied and then they called me for an interview and then they told me I got the, the spot. Um, and so then I set out to like write this thing and it's hard to like, they were like, you've got 12 minutes. And I was like, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and, but I got a ton of feedback from, you know, different coaches and friends and colleagues that I trust. And I practice it so much. I mean, in the weeks leading up to the talk, I rehearsed this thing like three or four times a day. Like some, when I was walking to the coffee shop, I do my TED talk. I did it in front of a bunch of different people to just try and get comfortable. Um, yeah, I sort of treated it like, um, like a monologue or something. Like I had the whole thing memorized and I just, I knew I was going to be so nervous that I just wanted to like know the words and know what I was saying. And feel very confident that I could do this because I'd practiced so much. And it also felt like a big deal. Like if I got this right, it could make a huge impact. And that is what happened. So I'm really, yeah, it was, it was a really cool project. And then actually getting up there and doing it was very exciting. Um, and I wanted to like, I got this advice from a 16 year old who was in, he did like a, a magic, it was like a magic show TED talk thing earlier in the day with his friend and it, that was really cute and but he he came off stage and he was like I don't even really remember it because it went by so fast and I just was so nervous and I thought to myself like that's like really good advice like I don't want I don't want to feel like I'm just trying to get through it and I'm you know I want to like enjoy this moment because it's going to be a big moment so I tried to do that I tried to go out on stage and like take a deep breath and like enjoy those 12 minutes <laughs> um and yeah it went well um 
it was a really cool experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. So I'm actually doing Toastmasters now. Do you know Toastmasters? I did that briefly as I was like yeah. trying to get into um public speaking yeah that's that's awesome yes it's, it's kind Are of like enjoying it um I started about three years ago I, I gave a talk in Soho House in in Barcelona um a private members club and I rehearsed 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 a lot and then I was I did it went really well like a 15 minute thing but I had notes and, and slides which help a lot for those situations mm-hmm. And then I went to Toastmasters and I did one table topics like the improvised speech for one minute on food, food, which is my second favorite subject. And I <laughs> froze and, and I realized I had a lot to learn. So now it's been three years. I do, I do want to give my own TED talk, um, but I just feel the last talk I gave, um, I went blank on stage twice. That's kind of like set me back a little bit. But I think also Toastmasters has, has this kind of like this style that I don't, I don't think is compatible with mm. TED. You have to kind of take you know pick and cherry pick some of the tips that they give you because some of it's just too rehearsed mm-hmm. and too robotic whereas if you're speaking from the heart you know that doesn't really it's not really compatible you know but I think yeah. it's good to get on stage and have that mm-hmm. um you know just to get used to being on stage and not being your own obstacle because that's one that one thing that I think everyone has to deal with you know you have this big message and you have to kind of get out of your own way and just yeah. deliver it yeah yeah it's not about you yeah it's about the like the impact of the message and it's about people listening yeah yeah that's hard and you know my mind has gone blank I I did quite a bit of uh, public speaking after the TED talk mm-hmm. um and I I was a keynote speaker at this blogger conference in Australia and my mind went blank at that thing and I just like made a joke about it <laughs> I was just like oh oh, and my mind has just gone black and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say next. And like people laughed and then I remembered where I was and I just kept going. Um, yeah, I think there are amazing tricks that you can do. I mean, I just went terrible. I just went, said to everyone, I'm nervous, which was the worst thing to say. <laughs> but I mean, now I'm kind of like, now it's happened. I hope it doesn't happen on the TED stage or something like that. That would be just awful. I'm sure they would edit it out. But still, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, I think, you know, like laughing at yourself. Also, people get it. They understand how scary it is to be up there. And it it can bring this like moment of, of humanity and like, yeah, just compassion. I think if you kind of like acknowledge it and move on, <laughs> at least that was what I tried to do. And you worked with speech coaches as well. Um, I worked with, I don't know if I'd call them speech coaches. There was like um, a woman I worked with who was kind of like a presence coach, which mm-hmm. more or less was the same thing. It was kind of just about like calming down your nervous system when you're in those situations. And I did a workshop with her. Um, and then there was, they gave you like a little coach for the TEDx events. So there was, I don't know what his credentials were, but he was helpful. He gave me some good feedback on my talk and that was nice. Oh, that's amazing. So it's a huge atre- achievement. And so it had so many views as well, hasn't it? It's, it's done really yeah. well. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's been viewed, you know, like 8 million times or something, wow. which is crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, that's the thing with the TED Talk is like, it can have a really big impact. Um, so I was like, just focus, just, you know, we can't over prepare for this thing. It's just <laughs> like that important, but yeah. I feel very grateful that um, my message resonated so far and wide. Definitely. So how do you see the vision or the future? How do you envision the future of multi-potentialites in general? Do you think it's, because I mean, in the past, I think our parents' generation, perhaps it was always, you know, do a degree, get the job in the same, in that that's yeah. related and work at that somewhere until you retire, you know. I mean, obviously that system <laughs> is broken. That's gone. That's long gone. Um, I think, you know, we're in this new chaotic world of work. And so multi-potentialites have an advantage there because we are adaptable. We are, intru- we are curious. We do want to learn about multiple things. Um, and I think you just kind of like need to find your own way. You need to like craft your own career there's no one model out there I mean I try and provide a few like a few models that can help you think about how to structure your career Mm -hmm. um but ultimately like yeah you need to kind of put it together for yourself put those puzzle pieces together and it can be really really satisfying when you do um and also I think getting comfortable with the fact that like 
things change and like you're never even if you find that perfect multi-potentialite blend of your passions and you're getting paid well and like 10 years down the road you might want something totally different and so kind of getting used to that idea that things are always evolving and also like learning to trust yourself that you'll you'll figure it out and getting the support that you need in terms of other people um yeah, all those things. But yeah, I would love to see more multi-potentialites kind of embracing their many passions and being unapologetically multipods, mm -hmm. doing their many things. Uh, and yeah, just kind of like thriving in the world and, and not feeling bad about it, about who we are. So do you offer that service as, as a coach then? How kind of creating someone else's multi-potentialite model? I have in the past. Um, I'm not currently doing any coaching. I have like a coach recommendation page for people, coaches I know who work specifically with multi-potentialites and are multipods themselves. Um, and you can find that on Putty Like. But yeah, I, I'm not doing any coaching right now. I'm kind of figuring out what's next for me. I'm taking this astrology program. And oh. so I'm like, Ooh, maybe I want to like blend some of that into my coaching. And um, I'm also working on a television uh script and project that I'm kind of pursuing so yeah but putty like continues to thrive and grow we've got a great community and yeah oh and astrology is so interesting <laughs> such an interesting yeah. topic yeah I'm just I'm finishing up a, an eight-month program next month and I'm working on actually you might be interested in this I'm working on my final project it's about relationships and astrology oh wow um, and I've got a survey where I ask people about their experiences in relationships and I asked for their birth data and I'm going to try and look for like markers in the birth chart that correspond to different types of experiences that I'm really excited to dig into that data and draw some conclusions or like in, interesting insights that might come out of that so yeah but I think it would be app, really um, co-star do you know co-star yeah yeah co-star is fun <laughs> what are you gonna say you think it would be really oh I was just gonna say I I I would love to like, I don't know, I'm playing with the idea of doing some kind of like career coaching mixed with astrology where we look at your chart and what it says about different strengths. And, and then I, we also talk about like what work models might work and your different passions. I'm not sure what that might look like, but I'm playing with ideas like that. <laughs> I think people love that. I think anything that people love, um, just kind of affirmation of who they are or just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, some, sometime from an external figure just to tell them what they are you know I think people love to do that kind of get to know yourself quizzes and numerology and uh yeah yeah, yeah that's one of the best things about astrology is it just it feels very affirming it's like oh even if there's like difficult things you're like oh okay that's why this has been a challenge in my life like I see it right there and that can be that that can be really helpful to both the, the strengths and some of the challenges yeah I'm a Gemini so I think I'm a natural multi potential like because Ge yeah. Geminis are very kind of all over the place in different areas you know Gemini is the classic multi potential -like <laughs> archetype yeah what about you um I'm a well so I'm an Aries sun uh -huh. um so I like to start a lot of creative projects um I'm a Taurus moon so I like some stability emotionally and then I'm a Virgo rising so the Virgo is a mutable sign I'm like good at a bunch of different things and I like to like do a lot of different things that's for me where the multi-potentiality comes in and I've also got a 10th house I don't know how much you know about astrology oh yeah I mean I know co-star so. <laughs> um but my 10th house is Gemini oh, wow. or at least in whole sign houses it's, it's coincides with Gemini and I've got my north node there so like my kind of like public persona is like that Gemini archetype that's like how I'm known in the world it makes total sense <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Gemini sun and then the moon and rising is both um Scorpio. So oh that's kind of nice. like it's like communication from the Gemini and multi-potentiality. But I, I for me, like Scorpio is related to sexuality, but it's also everyone mm -hmm. I know who's a Scorpio is really hard worker. And that's, yeah. that's they yeah. really like they really get into their maybe not Scorpio likes, but they're very hard to, workers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Scorpio likes to dig deep. Yeah. And like go 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 to like dark places or just like just get down to the core of things and so I think that like a fixed sign like that pairs really nicely with the Gemini sun because the Gemini sun can 
kind of like scan the horizon and explore different things. But then when you find something you're into, you've got that like Scorpio energy to like dig deep into that. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I hope you understand myself. Definitely. Okay. So a few quick questions. What's the book that changed your life? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, the book that changed my life. Um, mm, I really loved um, Amanda Palmer's book, The Art of Asking. Okay. Asking into book, for, for manifestation or for, or for asking for things in life? Um, it's so it's kind of about being an artist and being getting comfortable, like accepting gifts from other people and like asking for what you need. And um, I'm not doing a great job of describing it, but it's a wonderful book. It's sort of like a mix between self-help and also like a lot of personal narrative. And she's a great storyteller. Um, I love that book. Yeah. The Art of Asking. Okay. And do you have a phrase or affirmation or a quote that you live by? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't, not, not off the top of my head. Maybe I do, but I feel like if I can't think of it, then I probably don't. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I mean, like there's different values that are important to me. Authenticity is really important to me. Um, I have a very hard time being fake and I have a very hard time when other people are fake. So like, uh, yeah, that's, I don't know if it's like a, if I could put that into like a yourself quote, kind of, yeah, that sort of idea, um, in all of its complexity. <laughs> yeah. And what do you do to relax at the end of the day when, after your multi-potential light brain, mm -hmm. it must be all over the place. It must be very, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I guess just hanging out with my wife is really fun and relaxing for me. Do you have, do you find it easy to have like weekends off and um, do you schedule your time? It's, so it's, so you, yeah, it's been a process. It's very easy when you are self-employed to work all the time yeah. um, and all the time slash none of the time. It's just like, um, so I've had to be very, I've gotten better at having boundaries um, and when we had our son, we've got a seven month old. And when we had him, we were both self-employed. Well, Valerie works for Putty Like. Mm -hmm. And so we drew out a schedule. Like, this is when this person's working. This is when this person's working. And then the other person would be with the baby. And we have, um, right now we're, we're at her, her mom's place in Portland for the summer. But mm -hmm. back home, we've got like a, a shed outside that we've converted into an office. So like having that separation that's the office is not in the house that's been really helpful um yeah and then I I started giving myself weekends I think yeah having a kid <laughs> really forced me to to be better about boundaries and um I'm very grateful for that definitely that's something I struggled with for the first few years because it was so much fun what I was doing I just mm -hmm. working seven days a week you know and then now it's yep. like you know no what happened to my personal life <laughs> so yeah. you just don't know when work starts and life begins mm -hmm. sometimes okay so where can people find you people can find me at puttylike.com p-u-t-t-y-l-i-k-e.com and, and also the puttyverse.com um yeah there's th that those two sites will link to they link to all of my different things social media and all that but yeah perfect Okay, thank you so much for joining us today on the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been lovely. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for the opportunity.